Hey, I'm Nick Von Brack, and this is The Record Podcast. Back with an episode with a proper intro. It's been a hot minute, but uh, it's good. It's good to be back, sounding all all professional and radio-like. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a wild few weeks of being incredibly sick and been uh, traveling to New Orleans for work and just being bouncing all around and it was a, it was really crazy and now I'm kind of back in the on the home station and it's a little easier to get a nice little professional intro going here and it's good for today's guest who is my friend Josh Benash he is the former slash current slash former singer of Kiss Kiss he's also the singer of Vuvuzela and his own solo work you can find him all over the musical world and we talked about all that stuff we talked about his solo work we talked about Vuvuzela and Kiss Kiss, but we got into a lot of other good stuff too. We talked about, he's a big gearhead, so we got into some of his gear, uh, touring, his scoring movies, you know, all his musical work, uh, solo work versus collaborating, his own music history, and uh, his current stuff, his current EP that just came out, which you can get at joshbenash.bandcamp.com. You can listen to the EP there, and there's a link for the vinyl. And uh, I know usually for these episodes, we'll do some kind of giveaway or some kind of promotion, but I'm actually going to ask you guys to do me a favor and go to his website, joshbenash.bandcamp.com, and support him. He's trying to raise enough money to put this out on vinyl, and I have heard it, and I put a couple songs from it on, uh, on this episode, and it's really good. It is solid. And the, the vinyl itself is actually two albums, the... Uh, side, one side is the EP of his solo album, and the other side is Vuvuzela. So you're getting two albums for the price of one, and it's really good work. He's a great musician. If you've never heard his work before, you'll get to hear some snippets throughout this episode, but go back through Kiss Kiss and Vuvuzela, and now his solo stuff. He's an incredible musician, and he really puts together you know, very intricate, very deep, good music. So go and check out all that stuff listen to this episode you can hear some of the snippets there but go out on your own and support his stuff because he he, he does really great music and that's it we're not going to make it a long bloated intro uh next week's a good guest i already got it queued up ready to go so i'm excited for you guys to check that one out it's someone i've wanted to get on the show for a while and uh after that uh who knows no no recordings lined up right now so i'm gonna have to scramble and get some stuff done but that's all right because i got some good people in mind to do it so all right Back in the studio, back ready to do this stuff again. But for now, here's my interview with Josh Benash. Satellite, satellite, I am stupid. You shot your pictures through the air. All the people on the earth, they shot through it. And I hope they disappear. I've got a very laggy computer. Oh, is it Ooh, working? An SM7. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, I, uh, I took the plunge like I don't know two months ago, and because I was using. Um, let me see if I can if I have it anywhere. What is this? An uh, audio. Audio Technica 2020. It's like a USB mic, basically. Hold on, let me pretend to talk into mine. Okay. So we have we're an even. <laughs> Hold on. All right. <laughs> this is very podcast official now. Yeah, now it's it's not even plugged in. <laughs> well, whatever whatever's recording you right now sounds good and clear to me. So on oh, my computer. Oh, okay. Yeah, the um, this program that I use that records through Skype usually, I, I've yet to hear it really sound bad for anyone on the, on the other end. So it it does a pretty good job of just kind of like EQing out whatever's going on. So it's like thin, but it's still nice. very legible. So what what room? Where where are we right now? Where am I looking right now? This is my apartment, aka okay. studio. Nice. Yeah. And I see a lot of good stuff going on back there. I see a couple of keyboards. I see like if I can I can turn. Let me give you a, actually you know, very hard to turn it. Let me try. That's okay. I can you can just point out things if that's easy. Oh oh wow! 
Holy shit. So what, so what, what I'm seeing now is like seven or eight more keyboards. <laughs> it's a, a Home Depot cabinet full of analog keyboards. Yeah. Wow. And wow, that's incredible. And I mean, so there's like, and I'm actually, I miscounted. There's like five behind you. And then there's like seven of what you just showed me. <laughs> there, there's a lot of keyboards in here. <laughs> now, what, like, now this may be a very stupid and general question, but like, you know, each one like has a specific purpose for you. Like, all right, if I want this tone or this feel, I go to this one. Or do you just kind of noodle around with everything? No, I mean, at this point, I've had these for like a decade. I've been collecting okay. them for a long time. And I've had an ex-girlfriend ask the same question. Why do you need so many fucking keyboards? <laughs> it's like if you have two and I had to explain, it's like a different crayon. Right. One color is red, one right. is blue. Sometimes you want. <laughs> so, yeah, no, they, they do different things. Like most of them are mono. Right. Okay. I have some poly. And then, yeah. So when, like, so when, it, like what? Is that a new tattoo, by the way? It's it's new probably to you because when we. I haven't seen you. When I see you last. <laughs> It's been a long time. Yeah. I don't even know. Yeah, I, yeah, it's a uh, random band, random band bits onto onto a tattoo. Congrats on making a person with your penis, by the way. <laughs> which is which is the uh, the most unique way I've heard that. Congratulations, and I would not, and you know, you you deserve that that accolade. That goes to you alone. Thank you for the congrats. Um, How old? Uh, she's seven months, right? Uh, wait, what's the day today? Yeah, seven months today. Wow. I'm a When's bad the last father. time you slept? <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's actually not so bad lately. It's she okay. the the pro, the the give and take is that she's been sleeping in bed between us, so she'll sleep well, but then we don't sleep very well because she's just like going yeah, ape shit all night. <laughs> yeah, you have a human there. A little... Yeah, there's there's a little mini human that you're like, I'm gonna roll over and kill this thing accidentally. So, yeah. um, but no, it's not bad. It's better than it was when she was like, you know newborn or like two months that was those are some rough nights but uh i can imagine yeah not so bad lately um touring prepped you for that though right i mean p part of me part of me thinks that and then i'm like shit i you know i used to do pole all night drives like that's nothing and now i think about attempting to drive past like midnight and i would die like whoever was in that car would die with me there's yeah. no there's no chance <laughs> yeah it's a it's a yeah it's a young man's thing. It is. It's so weird. I was like, oh, that's just how, maybe that's just how I am. I could have been a truck driver. That's just my life. And it's like, no, that was just those years. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> no more. <laughs> so what, what, uh, what do you, what are you keeping yourself busy with right now? Aside from all of the instruments in the room. Besides the instruments, I've been teaching music lessons. That's kind of been my, oh, that's awesome. my bread and butter. Yeah. I give guitar lessons to kids and I've started doing like film scores for like horror films and whatever else I can get my hands on and That's great. commercials and things like that. So how, how does one end up in that? Is it just like getting your name passed around? Cause they know your work or is there like, no, it's been me going to film festivals by myself, getting drunk and schmoozing. That's awesome. So I'm very bad at schmoozing. <laughs> That's so true. That's what, that's what the drunk thing is. <laughs> a little liquid courage, but yeah. yeah, I've just been networking that way. That's awesome. So what, so I talked to to Mike Abuso a little while ago, and he talked about that he's doing a little bit of that. But like, what? I don't even know. I can't even con like conceive what that's like. Are are you, are are you given materials beforehand? Is it just this is the mood? Like what? Like how do you even get in that that space to do that? It, you know, I've done two features so far, and each one was different. Okay. So the one of them it had they had temp music, okay. so they had music from the movie Suspiria. You know, this the score by Goblin. Okay. It's like 70s Italian prog. Yeah. So, you know, I was pretty happy that that's what they wanted. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, so they give you a temp and they edit it to the score. So you're kind of stuck in a tempo, you know? Oh, okay. Uh, the other film that I got was just blank. And that was me just looking at, you know, going scene by scene and writing themes and kind of making it all work. And what? What do you, I mean, obviously they're different experiences completely, but like, did you enjoy doing one over the other or did one feel a little better to do? Uh, the first one I did, I enjoyed more because there was, I had real instruments, uh, you know oh, what I okay. mean? There was, it was, there was more time and more of a budget. Gotcha. So I had my friend Stephanie play harp. I hired a drummer to come and play uh, this guy, James. I don't know if you ever met him. He was the last bassist. Yeah, I think, I think so. Yeah. He came and did bass, so that that was more fun. I, and Rebecca played violin on it. Oh, awesome! So, 
Uh, the other one was basically me with all my keyboards for like two months. Oh, wow. Okay. Just, so that got a little, a little much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At what point are you like just bouncing off the walls? Like you've heard the, like, I, I feel like I, I, I relate it to like, if you start typing the same word, like if you're doing any graphic design stuff and you like make a word and then you go through every font and then you start to see the letters come apart and like the word just completely break into nothingness. Like at what point? musically or recording how long does that take for you to just start to like it's all just coming apart <laughs> well w with my process by the time i'm tracking i've already heard the piece about 900 times because <laughs> i'll start in sibelius yeah sibelius has a great tool which is you highlight how many bars of music you want within a certain amount of you know seconds in a scene yeah and it actually gives you the exact bpm Oh, wow. So okay. I do all the notation in Sibelius, make a, like a MIDI click track, and then bounce it into Pro Tools. Wow. But by the time I've done that and I've composed the piece in Sibelius, it's been already two days. You know? That's incredible. Like I've been listening to it nonstop. And then I have to track it. And then it's just me tracking right. 40 keyboard parts <laughs> for the same two minutes of music. <laughs> so it, the bouncing around happens. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for you, like you said, it was, you liked the first one because you were, you were collaborating with other people. It was real yeah, instruments. I, like I do like collab. I miss collaboration. Yeah. I do like that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I feel, I feel like enough. I mean, that's really doing anything enough by yourself, but like musically too, like I, I, I just, especially when it comes to drums, like I, I'm not the drummer who can sit at a kit and is like, all right, let's rip. Like I work way better in an environment with other musicians and like, that's the way that my mind works. Like by myself, I just, I could eventually come up with stuff, but it, it's such, it's such an ordeal yeah. to just create alone. Yeah, it is. Uh, I always find the ideas I'm most proud of come from collaboration. Yeah. You know, you get to throw your ideas back and forth. Sure. And actually I was going to, so that, that was going to be one of the things I wanted to get into is so for like, and we can go, we can go all the way back. I like to go all the way back in these sure. interviews, like musically, it, at least from my impression for Kiss Kiss, like you, I mean, you were the brains, like you were the, the or you were the, like the main songwriter in Kiss Kiss. And yeah. when it comes to a lot of your projects or what I've seen, that's kind of the the theme. Have you, have you been in a project where you're not the main, where you're just kind of like yeah. a musician in it? Okay. Well, the Vuvuzela was, uh, it was like a 50-50 split. Okay. Mm -hmm. Stephanie Babarak, we we're the ones, we wrote all the songs together. Okay. And we wrote them from scratch. Like, we both got into a room. I sat at the piano. She sat at the harp. And we just collaborated. That's awesome. So that, and that was the band after Kiss Kiss. Right. And I was actually really excited to be in that band because I didn't have all the singing and all the writing. Sure. Stephanie sang half. I sang, sang half. We split the writing. James wrote all his parts. The drummer, Ben, wrote all his parts. Great. So, yeah, that was, but that was short-lived. Yeah. Because James had a, made a human with his penis as well. <laughs> <laughs> and for for when you start into music in, in your life, does that is there a theme of like you kind of creating on your own or have you how did you I guess how did you get into music or like what sparked you getting into music? I was I was always into music like since since I was like four or five. Okay. It's always been something like I was obsessed with Guns N' Roses at like seven. Wow, I would have never picked that out as like the first band you would have been obsessed with. Lo Beach Boys and then Guns N' Roses. Those were like the first two. <laughs> So do you have, are you excited at all of them reuniting? No, I stopped listening to them when I was like 12. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I, I, even, 
even devout fans, I just, I'm just wondering, like, do you, are you really excited? Like, there's, it just can't, you know, it can't be good. Like, oh, I mean, I've heard the stories of Axel getting sand from Africa to put on the studio walls to get a special sound. Well, that's, well, that's funny that you should mention that you like Guns N' Roses and Beach Boys. That sounds like some Brian Wilson shit. <laughs> I still love, uh, yeah, it's true. I still love the Beach Boys, though. Yeah, yeah, I, I could see that. I could see They that. haven't, they haven't aged on me, but uh, yeah. What was so, the question again? Uh, so, so you, st- so that's where you started music. Like you, your first like big bands were Beach Boys and Guns N' Roses, and I was and then Nirvana when I was like eleven. Okay, and that became a huge thing, and that got me into like Sonic Youth and the Butthole Surfers and Dinosaur Junior, and then that got me into free jazz and like noise rock. Yeah, uh, and then I, when I was sixteen, I was going down to the Knitting Factory when it existed on Leonard Street in the city, New York City. And I was interning and going to as many free shows as I can. I did that for about two years. Oh, nice. Okay. So I've always been very into music. Yeah. And where, so you said, yeah, what point does like Tiny Tim and like music that's <laughs> like, because <laughs> the only reason I know about Tiny Tim is because we toured with you guys and you showed, showed us, showed us. I had that. a phase. <laughs> <laughs> a tiny Tim phase. with me like i guess or does that like ballpark or that you know that area of music does that hit you and like change things or is it just another kind of thing that you like is it all just kind of like you know aggregating? i don't know if that changed anything i think that i like eccentric yeah. people in general okay I like I liked outsider music and outsider art for a long time, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah Tiny Tim was a short lived thing. Okay. Yeah. I got to play his song, uh, She Left Me with the Herpes in a porn store once. The guy was listening to, uh, he was listening to his iPod. It's like, can I put on my op- iPod real quick? First, I played Ave Maria and six people left. And I put <laughs> How on do you get people to leave a porn store? <laughs> Yeah, how to get people to leave a porn store. But it's some good old fashioned. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <coughs> so then, so then, at what point does you actually uh, playing music or pl- picking up instruments? Is when does that come into play? Uh, when I was like thirteen, I had always wanted to play guitar. I wasn't allowed. Okay. Yeah, I was not allowed. And then when I was 13, I I got my I found my mom's old guitar that she used to use. It's like an old beat up acoustic and I started playing that. Okay. And then it started getting taken away from me because I had really bad grades in middle school uh, and high school. <laughs> fair enough. But, yeah. But since then, and then I was I started bands as soon as I picked up an instrument and thought I could play it. So were you ever in band or any kind of like high school, middle school band? You know, I tried when I was, I, I didn't have like a, I didn't have the formal training until I was in college. Wow. That's incredible. So, so I, when, I actually did not know music theory. I didn't know what music theory was until I was like 18, 19. Like I, I, I started playing and I didn't have an ear for it whatsoever. I just had like enthusiasm. Wow. I feel like if I were just to guess that you have been in like band and played instruments since you could get started. Like, I feel like no. your, your knowledge of that makes me think that i was born with the i think i was born with the creativity and the desire but none of the technical skill wow (laughs) well that's well that's where i still am today (laughs) (laughs) it it just goes to show i guess you really pick it up at any time but holy shit that's i got kicked out i I joined the the jazz band in high school i went for one class and uh the teacher told me my playing was disgusting (laughs) what is that like just not like not the way they wanted it to be or like well, how what is that well mean? you know i was coming from listening to nothing but nirvana and sonic youth oh, okay and i was like i should start learning other music it would be good for me to expand yeah so i signed up for the jazz class had no fucking idea what a seventh chord was and just played power chords over everything was told yeah. to leave <laughs> <laughs> well, what do they expect did you lie and say you knew all no, this I stuff? never lied well that's what i mean so what do they what do they expect it's just a bitter bitter old man i don't uh, know <laughs> that's all right <laughs> so that so so guitar is your is your first instrument when do you start playing piano or keyboard i started playing piano 
in the senior year of high school when I started cutting more classes and I would hide in the music room. Okay. They had like little practice rooms and I yeah. started teaching yeah. myself. Like I, I've never had a piano lesson either. Wow. And man. that's something I wish I did. Cause I, I do wish I was more classically trained. So the, the, the playing that I've done on piano is all self-taught. And do you give lessons on piano too, or just guitar? No, I don't give lessons. Oh, okay. On, I don't feel, you know, I would be stealing people's money if I sat down and tried to teach them piano. Well, no one's ever done that. So, like, here's the elbow technique: you just <laughs> your whole arm on the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get that? Did you write that down? Okay, good. Exactly. <laughs> so, okay, so you're, so how do you how do you get into like a music program without having learned to like be classically trained until you said until you got into the program when i signed up for the music program i was outright rejected oh shit! and i tried to get into the regular school and i was outright rejected as well because my grades were so low yeah so my first year i did uh continuing education okay. and i basically proved that i you know was capable of <laughs> work <laughs> and then I basically just went to all the music teachers and told them what happened and asked if I can audit their classes and they okay. said yes and I literally spent a year like every night by myself in a practice room practicing and studying wow and acing the tests even though I wasn't in the classes and then when I showed up to audition the next year they just let me in wow that is dedication man it's dedication you know? <laughs> <laughs> so do you have a degree from the school or did you just do some time and then Bam. No, I, I graduated. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. When I, so Jared was on the first ones I interviewed and he talked about how you two, that you went to the same school. And that's SUNY Purchase. Yeah. Okay. And that's when and Jared met. actually, he quit the music program halfway through and done and went to journalism. Okay. Yeah. And that's, and that's where you two met and that's where that's, but is that where you started playing in bands was, was there? <laughs> I was in a band called Fetal Orchestra. Yes. That, there you go. Now, now it's ringing a bell. And uh, Jared, Jared joined that band pretty early on, yeah. Okay. And what, what were the, what were the early days of of that band, or just being in bands, or meeting with Jared? Like, was it just just for fun, or was it like you already had a goal in mind to like? No, me and Jared. I mean, you've met Jared. Yeah. Jared's a serious guy. Yes. He wants to do what he wants to do, and yeah. when we met, we just we both worked our asses off. Like okay. we were constantly booking tours. And finding members, we went through like 19 lineup changes because we couldn't find people serious enough to want to, you know, jump in a van for three months and right. do a tour for no money. <laughs> it's, it's a hard sell. It's a hard it's sell. It's a hard sell, yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, Jared was super motivated. And when, you know, he was the only one in Kiss Kiss besides myself that was a constant member from day one. Yeah. Yeah. And at what point... Do you transition from, does it go from Fetal Orchestra to Kiss Kiss or is there stuff? No, there was a band in the middle. Okay. I started a band called the Silver Suns. Okay. And we had like three shows and that was it. Okay. It didn't really, it didn't go anywhere. Jared was playing with uh, some other guys at the time and was more into that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, it took a while. It took about a year after Fuel Orchestra to kick up, you know, Kiss Kiss. Okay. And again, is it, is like... When you start the band, is it just a thing of, all right, these are these players and this is what we're creating? Or do you have a goal in mind of like genre or style? or Had just... no goal. Okay. Uh, the reason Kiss Kiss had a violinist is because we happened to be friends with the violinist. Okay. And he joined the band and he was, you know, I know the band O Death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That violinist was the first Kiss Kiss violinist. Oh, wow. That's right. Okay. And when we started playing with him, we just fell in love with the sound of it. Yeah. We started writing songs based around the instruments that we had. And then when he left, we really wanted to continue with that. Yeah. Okay. But in the beginning, there was no, there was no goal. And, and as this is a question that keeps coming up that I keep forgetting to ask. And I kind of sure. want to use this podcast to get into it with you since I'd say you're more, you'd have more knowledge of this than even more, more so than other people I've talked to. Like what, I guess, what is the songwriting process like for you or like what, I'm sure every song you could tell a different story, but like, is it, I guess when you go, when you're, when that process is happening, what, what's that like for you? I don't know. I mean, early on the Kiss Kiss songwriting was actually split between me and uh, the first fine Linus Bob. Okay. Uh, the first, the uh, reality versus the optimist was supposed to be half my songs, half Bob songs. Okay. And then he left. And then I had to go into the writing room basically and just write all the new songs. Right. Uh, 
the process for those was uh, I'd write a song and then I'd sit down with Jared and he would, you know, he was the rhythm master. He would yeah. con- uh, time signatures and we, you know, arrange the parts. I'm trying to think. So it was much more like even what you're doing now with composition. It was kind of you were like composing the song. It wasn't like you were in a room just jamming, ra- throwing random. Like, yeah, we didn't ideas. do the- we tried that in the beginning and it was always, it felt meandering. Okay. Like the, there wasn't, and you know, especially when you get into intricate music. Sure. You have something that's changing keys every other bar and time signatures. It's hard to just jam on that. You right. know? It's, yeah. Yeah. I do so, always, I do always wonder when I hear like very technical bands, I'm like, what is a jam? Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> how does that even work with this? So, no, I mean, reality versus the optimist was notated on Sibelius as well. Oh, wow. Okay. The whole record was notated. All the string parts, the bass parts, guitar parts, every beat was written out. Same thing with the, the second record. I mean, that's how we wrote. Yeah. And do you do you ever find yourself, like, getting in a room and jamming, or is that pro- is that process just not conducive for, like, what you like to do? With Kiss Kiss? With anything, I guess, just musically. Uh, Yeah, with Vuvuzela, that's what we did. Okay. That was all, that was all in, and- the t- in the room at the time. And yeah, we wrote the songs together at the same time. Okay. Yeah. And, and when you do, when you, when you're in Kiss Kiss and you've, and you've started writing music, at what point does it start getting more serious or does eyeball come along or like, I guess like, yeah, what's the journey there? I had sent, uh, our, actually, no, I don't remember. We played a house show in Jersey and somehow one of the bands gave, that CD to Jeff, I think, of Thursday. Okay. And uh, they contacted me, and at the time, I was renting out a warehouse space in Kingston, New York. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just like a disgusting basement, and we throw, you know, DIY shows. And the guys from Eyeball came out to see us there and basically signed us that night. Wow. I mean, it was literally... It, it, the label thing kind of fell into our laps. We hadn't yeah. really tried. We hadn't shopped around. It just happened, and we were like, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> And that label, even more so than others, seems like one. I mean, like you said, they just showed up and signed you. Was was that the kind of was their approach just very laid back and like you do your thing and we're just going to support it and we're and all very, into this. We didn't even have a signed contract for like a year and a half. Oh wow! Okay, it was very laid back. They were giving us you know money to record. We, they were putting out our records, and there was no. There's nothing but a verbal agreement. Yeah. Yeah, oh, was yeah. was there any time anything you guys did? Did they ever have anything to say about it? Like, I don't know about that. Or were they just all in? Yeah, we did make a Christmas video. <laughs> I don't know. I think ever... I do recall this video. <laughs> we thought it would be funny to do a bukkake version of White Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we filmed it where I'm on my knees singing White Christmas while everyone else is in their underwear spraying me in the face with milk. Hmm. <laughs> and... Uh, as soon as we made that video and sent it out, I was like, there's no way I can allow this on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> there's, it's not, it's never been uploaded there. It's just, it's gone. Wow. But yeah, when we did that, actually, I take that back. We actually did that at Alex's house. The guy who owned eyeball, he was totally for it. <laughs> it was our manager that said, you guys uh... are insane for doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so no, so, so to answer the question, no eyeball was, yeah, never... they were fine. <laughs> It's the, it's the management. It's like, yeah. <laughs> That's great. And and did you guys ever uh, play alongside or tour with any other eyeball bands? Or like, did they support you oh, in yeah. that way? Yeah. We, I mean, Murder by Death took us out. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And I think what they did is they kind of went to the eyeball roster and they just kind of looked to see who was on it and who was touring. And they asked us to play. Awesome. Which was very awesome. That was the, honestly one of the best tours for us that we've ever did or done. There was a there was a band that was on Eyeball that I feel like you guys would have fit with very well, and I'm curious if you ever play with them. The Tiny. I loved the Tiny. Now I'm thinking maybe I was stone. I felt my feet lift off the ground, and my heart was screaming. And my bones, I need you close As he's in the middle of the street 
you ever get to play with them? No, they were from Sweden, right? So, that, so that's what I thought, and I wondered if like they just got them to come over and like just so happened to put you guys. We with toured them. with Tiger Lou, and know. they were from I don't know if I'm uh, with them. Scandinavia. Okay, I forget which country exactly. I think Sweden as well. Okay, but we toured with those guys, and they were amazing. And they were on eyeball too. They were an eyeball, yeah. Okay. But no, the tiny we never got a tour with. I never got to see them live. Yeah, that would have been. I would have loved to have seen them live at some point. Yeah, me too. Their music was great. Yeah, and did I'm um, trying to think what other eyeball bands like Thursday took us out Thir- for a little bit. How so? How does that that audience? What do they What do they make a kiss kiss? I think they liked it. It was it was uh, us, uh, moving mountains, fall of Troy, and Thursday. Wow. Yeah, that's a pretty that's a that's a pretty diverse like and that that, so that's what my thinking is like you don't sound exactly like Thursday. So that should be palatable because they're going there to see Thursday. They don't want to see just four Thursday bands. So like I feel like, oh, this is something else that piques my interest and is like different and technical and pretty. Yeah. So so that but that's that tour is like seems completely all over the place. That seems like a, a good package to be on. It was it was just it was it was really difficult to stand on the stage. If you saw how many drum sets were oh, back God. <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a ninth, I just, that's all I remember is literally standing on the monitor. Oh man. Which is good. Which is great. You yeah. Know, <laughs> part of the experience. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like of all the bands that we toured with, I, I feel like you guys were very similar to us in that you really could put us in any kind of venue and be like, all right, I guess this is what we're doing. Like we wouldn't really complain. We just figure out a way to make it happen. Even if ideally it wasn't, you know, our favorite was like, all right, fuck it. I guess this is what we're doing now. <laughs> yeah. Now there's a few things that I've walked away from. Oh, really? One, one show in particular where I kept getting electrocuted. Well, that's a good enough reason. <laughs> <laughs> I remember going up to the microphone and having my eyes vibrate in my oh, skull. My God. I, there was a show we played and Matt, same thing was happening to Matt. We're like, he was getting shocked. So like, I, I've never seen him really get pissed and he was, get, I could see him like visibly, like he was getting pissed. And I was like, he must be like over and over zap, zap, zap. Oh like, yeah. Ele- being electrocuted is, is very angry. Yeah. It, it's it, not it, fun. It, it, it looks, it looks terrible. <laughs> yeah. I do not enjoy it. So with, with touring with kiss kiss, was there, was there any other idea? Cause I feel like, Kiss Kiss could have gone on and you could have toured with like full orchestras. Like, was there any other ideas for like adding more members or like making it like, like doing bigger tours or like kind of making it more grandiose or. I think we've always wanted to do that. It's just yeah. a matter of finances. Well, sure, and yeah. Practicality. Yeah. I, and, want, uh, I wonder for me towards the end touring was like really difficult for me. Sure. I had undiagnosed uh, celiac. Oh, so okay. I was, allergic to wheat and eating nothing but like wheat on the roof. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Cause this musician is what you're doing. Right. So I was just like constantly sick and not knowing why. And it just kind of, it broke me down in many ways. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I do. Uh, and it's, the, it's going to always be the first memory I think of with you. And it's just sure. because it was the first night I met you was when you stayed, you stayed, at, we all stayed at my parents' house. Did I sleep and, in a weird spot? And you just slept in your tent in the, in the yard. Oh and no. I, I slept in a tent for like every single tour for five years. <laughs> I had a tent, an extension cord, and every episode of that '70s show, and that was basically my night. <laughs> I and and I I felt bad because I was like, oh shit, there's like cats in this house. Like he must be like terribly allergic or something. Oh, I love cats. <laughs> <laughs> and then and I think I do remember like you did have something plugged in, and you said your whole little setup. I was like, shit, all right, whatever makes him happy. Man. I had like, a cot too by the end of it, an army cot. <laughs> right, home away from home. That's right. You you do have to make it your home away from home. You have to, yeah. <clears throat> that '70s show. I would have never picked you for that '70s show, guy. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> it was a, it was a thing. I don't know wh- why. That and Tiny Tim just each had their own little spaces for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 yeah. So you, I, I, what, what interests me a lot about Kiss Kiss is like what, what other kinds of tours you could be on, and like what audiences would think because that that was the thing with us was like we're like all right oh we're finally on a tour with a band that that we it seems like we would work with and then we go on tour and then just crickets we're like oh all right this this isn't what i thought at all like for for a band like yours that is very different and like challenging and musically interesting i just i wonder are there tours that worked better than others or is it just you know completely flip of the coin every time you know i think that we should have left the country 
And I, I think had, there was, I could see you doing some really good stuff in like Europe and we had offers in Europe. We had offers in Japan and it just never, you know, materialized. Yeah. Uh, but we did, I mean, we toured with pop punk bands and we play for a room of 13 year old girls who were just looking at us completely confused. <laughs> what, <laughs> what pop punk bands did you guys tour with? I don't remember. The, I don't remember That's the fine. names to be honest. Jared <laughs> is like the, the dictionary okay. of every tour okay. and, <laughs> yeah, yeah it was it was awkward and it kind of was felt like a waste of time because every night we were playing we were playing for people who did not give a shit and were confused by it were those tours that a manager or booking agent said like here you should do it or like who's i guess or are you just guys like you know what we just want to keep touring so that's what's up that's- i think that's i think we did it okay i think we were the ones who did that yeah okay. yeah it's 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 funny when i think back on like some of the big tours we got on. And at the time it was like, this is going to be life changing. And you know, this is a big band, even if we, even if we don't sound like them. And then in, in retrospect, thinking back, I'm like, we probably could have turned down some of these tours. Not that they were like a waste of time, but yeah. like, were they almost because it's like, yeah, you're spending a lot of time out there. You're hustling. And it's like, not that you could necessarily lose fans by going on tour, but you're, I'm going out there and I'm just p- I can see I'm pissing people off. <laughs> like they do not, they're not enjoying themselves. You lose oomph though, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's only so many hours that I think a group of people can sit in a van together and you're spending some of those. Right. <laughs> yeah. Know? And that's true too. Yeah. It, it is. Uh, I mean, we had two shows once. I remember uh, we were opening for the Pogues in Florida and we were supposed to play at 11 a.m. at a, in a field. <laughs> in like some random part of Florida wow. for the Harvest of Hope Festival. And I'm, I remember thinking in my head, the Pogues is going to be awesome. That's yeah. fucking great. Why are we going to drive through the night to play at 11 a.m. Yeah. on a Saturday when everyone's been drinking since Thursday? Right. Get to the Pogue show. They put us on an hour before the doors open. <sighs> what is that? There was 30 drunk guys in the front yelling at Rebecca to take her tits out. Wow. I end up mooning everybody. <laughs> And then playing, I had a, a wooden whistle that I got at like a tag sale on the road or whatever. Yeah. I literally just played it one note as high as possible for like 10 minutes. And that was the end of the show because they absolutely hated us. Continuing to play would have just been in, like, you might as well have fun with it. At that right. Time. Yeah. Right? They hate you. It's not going to change. They're yelling to see your violinist tits. Yeah. Like, oh, that's the crowd that's there. Work with it. Right. <laughs> you know? Exactly. So we played that show. We ate as much steak as we can possibly fit in the bus. <laughs> we drive through the night. None of us really sleep. We get to the Harvest of Hope. We get on stage at 11 a.m. and there's 600 people there. And it's one of the best shows that we've ever done. Yeah, that's and that's that's part of the problem is like when when we would get to where we're like, there's no there's no reason that this would work, like that people are going to like us. And then those are the ones that are like, wow, OK, those work. And then the ones that we think, oh, we're going to all of the world will be laid out before us with this tour and then just nothing. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. all right, I really don't know shit about this industry, like at all. Yeah, I don't think anyone does. It's <laughs> of, it, and especially now, it's even I don't get it now. Yeah. And I actually I went to a CMJ conference like four years ago. Yeah. And uh, it was an indie rock conference. And everyone who at, raised their hand to ask a question for, to the panel was asking, what kind of music should I write to get into commercials? And it just made me so sad. Yeah. <laughs> like, who? A- why would you ask that? What right. kind of music should I write to get into a credit card commercial? Right. Well, let's see. You need a Glockenspiel. You need a <laughs> ukulele. And then you need everyone to go, hey, this time through a lot of reverb, right? But, <laughs> yeah, it was just, I, you know. Maybe you should have been up there on stage given that conference. Oh, God. I would have yelled at everyone. <laughs> I would have played that that uh, train whistle at the highest note possible, and exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, 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 yeah. So some of so some tours like that and shows like that, where like it's slowly kind of draining you. Is is there a point where you kind of draw a line in the sand and say like I I just can't be on the road anymore, or do you just, or does it kind of just fade out and then you're just more playing, you know, creating music at home and being at uh you know bands locally. You know, for us, it just kind of, the last tour definitely felt like the last tour. Yeah. You know, like it was, there was just, it was not the best mood. People were just, I think, tired. Yeah. Uh, For me, I I love playing shows. It was one of my favorite things in the world. But like, there's only so many times you can 
have 23 grueling hours for one hour of satisfaction. Sure. Like the payoff started to become not worth it. Yeah. And it's not because of the touring or the band experience itself, but it just felt like the whole industry got pulled out from under us and yeah. everyone else. Like when I was younger, bands like Mud Honey, you know, not the biggest bands ever, but they can sell 50,000 records sure. and fund their lives. Yeah. You know, we went from uh, our first record, we sold 6,000. And then the next record, we sold like 2,000, but our audiences had like tripled because yeah, no one's weird. buying the records. Right. And music, you know, became not worth anything as like a, as a commodity that you, you could sell. Yeah. I go to shows now and people are like, we have free, you know, MP3 sticks and take them, you know, it shouldn't be like that. And yeah. it's sad yeah. that it is, but for me, it just kind of, you know, you, you forsake relationships, you forsake a solid income. You forsake sleeping in your own bed, right. you know, right. having like a, 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 a life centered around an area and the, the, the outlook just didn't look good, you know, yeah. at least in my perspective. And it was kind of a bummer and I wish that wasn't the case, but yeah, it's uh, it is certainly like a lotto ticket. Like, <laughs> like you are, but it's one where you have to like, instead of just pay $5 to get and scratch off, like you are just spending all of the hours, all of the time, mentally, physically. Yeah, you like you said, you're like you're 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 writing off relationships, like friendships. You're you see him one day, and then like the next time you see him, you realize you haven't seen him in like five years. Like everything yeah. is just you're betting it all on black, and then and it's not even like oh well, if I do that and I put in the work, like there is that thing of ten thousand hours, but it's still not even guaranteed. Like you could put in the ten thousand hours, and it and then everything's just changed where. But it's not even, it's not even, it wasn't even that to me. It was like, it went from a casino where, you know, the odds are against you, yeah. but you could potentially win money. Yeah. Right. It went from that mm -hmm. to gambling at like Dave and Buster's where you just win like, <laughs> th th there's no money anymore. Yeah. Prize. Yeah. The odds are still staggering and you're going to win a plastic hat. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's true. And, and on top of that, like you said, like all these people that are telling you these are the steps to take or like we're going to manage you and provide these things like they don't really know what they're talking about either because they can say they do and you could see like well they've had success with these bands but every time it's completely different they could have you know one if their roster is 10 bands they could have one that does well and that's what they're known for but they yeah. probably gave up on eight or nine others because they didn't turn out the same way and luckily for us the manager we had was like very honest about everything okay. right up front like he wouldn't even take us on until he spoke to us and realized we didn't have crazy expectations okay so that's he's good. like what are your goals i was like honestly i'll be happy if 100 people show up a show and he's like cool that's manageable let's do it <laughs> that's awesome yeah so that was good yeah we we had we had much more of the other experience and not so much like we're gonna make you stars but it was like oh this is going to work i see how this is going to work and we can grow you like basically across the board is what we were said. And as soon as that wasn't producing, like I think their assumption was, well, it'll take off and we'll kind of hang on instead of like, we know what to do and we'll do that for you. And as soon as it yeah. stopped, as soon as it wasn't, it was, as soon as it was evident that that wasn't the case, then everyone slowly started dropping off and we're like, Oh, so that's how this kind of works. then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like a catch 22. No one will, no one will be your booking agent until you pack a room. Right. Right. <laughs> And that's like, well, how do, wait, how do I do <laughs> I mean, it? Is the whole industry is this thing of like, yeah, we're, we won't, we're, a record label is not going to sign you until you sell 20,000 records. Well, how in the fuck am I going to sell 20,000 records without a record label? Like, it's, yeah, you know it's, it's the, the best times I had in Kiss Kiss were the, the beginning when yeah. I didn't care about, you know, I was young and I didn't care about making a living off of it. Yeah. Didn't care. I went out there and I played music because that was what I loved doing. And we played house shows where it would be packed. It would sound like garbage. There would be kids like sweating into your equipment and spilling beer on you. Yeah. But it was fun. Yeah. You know, like I would take that any day over, you know, a venue where you get 20 minutes. They count in your T-shirts at the door. It's uh, like we take 20 percent. for You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that started to take the fun out of it. And when I quit Kiss Kiss with everyone else, because we all kind of did it at the same time. Yeah, it was, you know, it was a depressing few years because I didn't know what to do. Like, that was literally my identity for a decade. Right. Was that I'm going to be in a band. This is what I'm going to do. And it took a few years to realize I don't give a shit if I quote unquote make it. I don't care if I make money from it. I do it because it's what I love and I'm going to continue doing it. Yeah. 
So I feel like I'm at that place again, where I was in my early 20s, where I have my studio and I spend as much time in here as I can. I just recorded, you know, a new solo record because I want to. Do I yeah, think anything's awesome. going to come of it? I don't care. Yeah. I recorded songs because that's what I do. <laughs> you know, I yeah. record music. Well, and it is, it is funny how that kind of works out because I feel like our career was similar in that, like, we started playing and recording out of a basement, like, recorded for as cheap as we could. It was the most fun. And then we started getting attention and doing things that were bigger. And at the end, our last EP was the same thing, just all in the same room again, just as cheap as possible, just having fun. And I feel like for a lot of a lot of artists that I look up to, that is a very similar track of like, it starts the same way that it kind of ends. It's like, it ends up being fun again. You're doing it for why you started doing it. And you're yeah. in your own, you're in your own room in the same, like if you would have started Kiss Kiss, it could have been in the same exact situation, the same room, the same circumstances. So yeah. it's, the, it's the same space to be creative and free to write the music that you want to write again. And that's kind of the whole reason anyone does this. Yeah. But I think I think it's great. I mean, I you even you just turn the camera and showing all those instruments like if I could draw up a room that you would be in, that would be the room. It would be this room with a shitload of keyboards, guitars and like just the space and time to do what you want to do. And then lots of Ren and Stimpy pictures. Ah, oh, that's great. That is perfect. That yeah, is perfect. Please. Best episode too, man. Oh, that is great. It's autographed. That is, you know, I do remember that episode. And and I think some channel is starting to play them again, kind of like late, and I catch one now and then, and I'm like, holy shit. Like, I knew Ren and Stimpy was like a little darker, but like, <laughs> it is fucking dark, man. And I see it now and then, and I'll put SpongeBob on for, for Charlotte, my daughter, and it, I see little glimpses of it every now and then, like the grotesque close-ups and like, zooming out on like m a mole with hair out of it. I'm like, that's yeah. running stiffy. That's that shit. Like they, that... they did that. Yeah. <laughs> but that the, I, I will never forget running like that. There, that, that is the kind of thing that like stood out on its own and was weird. And anyone I talked to, like, I mean the people that I, that I looked to looked up to or like that I was friends with, like loved it. And anyone else was like, it's disgusting. Like, I don't even <laughs> want to, I don't want it on near me. Like, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so what, now, now that you, so you just recorded an EP, you said, and that's, that's just under your name? It's under my name. Yeah. coming out in on may 3rd i'm doing a basically a, a pre-order i'm trying to press it onto vinyl oh awesome okay and uh the band vuvuzel is going to be on the side on the second side awesome so, yeah, originally so was, is it going to be a split or yeah originally i was trying to find other bands who wanted to do a split with me yeah and i couldn't i couldn't find people who wanted to do it <laughs> yeah fair enough finding people who love vinyl enough to make a headache out of it right with a, pre-order campaign and sitting there mailing them out for 20 days. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Again, a hard sell. Oh uh, yeah. A little bit of a hard sell, but I love vinyl. So yeah. And, and what stylistically or musically would you say this is akin to, is it just kind of like continuation of how you've written otherwise, or this is like a complete departure? You know, for, I, I did two solo records prior to this. Mm-hmm after Kiss Kiss broke up and they, they were kind of more mellow and I was writing for what I had available to me. Right. So I was writing for keyboards and kind of more subdued kind of trippy music. Yeah. This one is more Kiss Kissy. Like there's okay. more, there's this odd times there's just distorted riffs and screaming. And then I have Stephanie doing vocals awesome. as well to juxt juxtapose my rants. Awesome. I'm excited to hear what that sounds like. I sent it to you. You sent it to me. I sent it to you. F from what? How? How did you from, send it? To me? From the Facebooks. Oh, okay. It, wait, it was, I sent it was, you a, a link and a password. You can download. Awesome. Well, then I'm going to check. And 
depending on when I put this out, like as long as you don't care, I'm going to put, you know, a song or two off of it in this Please. Uh, episode. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And I'll, I'll send you a link too for the vinyl pre-order. Oh, nice. Yeah. And what, are you doing anything crazy with it or is it just standard vinyl? Are you doing like colored or like, I That's don't know. Gonna be, actually, it's cheaper to do random color. Yeah. I've seen that. Because they just take the scraps and they throw it right. in. And for this, it actually will work really well. The cover I had done, this girl did these beautiful watercolor paintings. Yeah. So I think the splattered color vinyl will kind of match that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that. And then each one is its own custom vinyl. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Um, and what otherwise, is, so you're you're doing, uh, you're putting out the solo album, you're composing, you're giving lessons, like... I mean, I don't want to say that that's not enough, but like, what else is going on? Like, what else? What What else are you filling your time with? Are you just hanging that's out, and reading, or I mean, just about, just wall to wall working? I'm working as much as I can. Yeah. Just because when I stop working, I start to think. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to keep myself busy, but I am. Sure. Yeah. It's when the darkness starts to creep in. Exactly. You gotta. You know, <laughs> Got to stay distracted. Sh- shine the keys in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> and what for lessons are you like, are you putting up flyers? Like, is it like, how, how is that? How's that? How's yeah, that? I, I do the flyer thing. Okay. I hit every place that a mid 40 soccer mom will go to on a Tuesday. Starbucks. Starbucks, <laughs> the nail salon. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Found all my clients doing that. Yeah. And are you finding like kids that are, like enthusiastic or are they just there because their parents want them to get out of the house? Like some of them are there because their parents have to have every hour structured and booked. Yeah. Constantly. Yep. With numerous activities. Yeah. But some kids are really into it and I'm finding a bunch of kids who are like 15 and are buying like pavement reissues on vinyl. Wow. And they want to learn music from the nineties. And I feel like a happy old man when they say that. (laughs) (laughs) Like one single tear just goes down your face yeah. as they're spinning the album. Exactly. <laughs> what about That's you? Great. What have you been up to? Uh, not a lot, man. Yeah, doing this, doing the podcast, and uh, just family shit. Um, the boys the boys all live in the city. I live up in the Burbs. And uh, right. Matt's doing uh, a solo hip-hop project called Sophagus. And all right. it's really great. Like he's, I don't know if you were ever into that video game, uh, Music Generator. That was like a PlayStation game. And it was basically like, it was kind of, it was kind of like, um, I mean, any of these software where you just, you know, put all the colored squares in order and that makes the song, you know, it's like, uh, like, uh, programming. It's like and Mario he, Paint. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> it, it is, is exactly what it was. And Adam and Matt would make these incredibly beautiful songs. <laughs> and like, now it's, it's like come full circle. Cause like he's making hip hop beats and rapping over them. And it's, it's super good. And I think you'd, you'd, you'd enjoy it. Cause like, the production that he's that he's uh, he's creating it's it's really cool. Um, so Matt's doing that, and uh, Adam just started his own musical project called Beethoven, I think, and it's like <laughs> Beethoven with beach in it, and it's like he he just posted a couple demos, and they're like songs that he one of them is definitely a song he wrote a long time ago, and I think I think he's playing guitar and singing, so I think this is like him getting like the songs that he's kind of written and not done anything without. And, um, and Andrew's, Andrew's kind of bouncing around. He's done a couple music videos. He's, um, I know he's like being a photographer and just kind of like doing all kinds of shit. Um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. I'm just doing the suburb dad shit, man. Just working a, working a job, uh, being a videographer, video editor, and then, uh, all trying right. to do, trying to do as much of this as possible really. Um, cool. but yeah, yeah, that's it, man. Is it like corporate stuff you have to edit or? Yeah, <laughs> it's an it's an insurance company, so it's all yeah, you know, it is what it is. I uh, every now and then, like for a long time, especially after the band, I had a very big kick of like I want to go and shoot a documentary, kind of show showcasing like what it's like to actually be in a band, and like because we'd get home from tour and people would be like, "Oh, how is tour?" And I was like, "Well, we slept in a Walmart parking lot." We <laughs> all shared one jar of peanut butter and we pissed into water balls after that. And they're just like exactly. disgusted yeah. by it. And so for a long time, I was like, no one knows that side. And I'd love to show that. And then eventually I kind of worked my way into doing this. And I was like, oh, I guess I can kind of do that with this. Like, Nick, now of- how many relationships you would save if you made that documentary? Because every <laughs> girlfriend, when you go on tour, thinks that you're 
surrounded yep. by girls with large breasts who all want to have sex with you. <laughs> and the truth is, we're it in disgusting messy. bars <laughs> in random places with a bunch of dirty guys yep. make fart jokes. You know, and I'm hoping someday maybe <laughs> I can still do the documentary, but like, it is so funny because even still, yeah, at the time, like, the uh, Jen, the, you know, my wife, that was the girl I was dating at the time that we toured. I've you know been dating a long time. And even then at the time, it was like, yeah, no matter what I would say, it was like, mm, that sounds fishy. And I was like, really? I don't know how to paint this for you more. Like, there is nothing going on. We are sitting in this van. It smells like shit. No one wants to be around us. Like, I can't I can't paint this picture for you more disgustingly than I'm sure I'm sure that you saw more penises on tour than boobs. <laughs> a right? thousand more penises exactly. before a boob. I mean, it and and really, yeah, touring. It's it's like, OK, and, and she has brothers. So it's like the, the way I guess I could translate is like, OK, you know how your brothers are disgusting. OK, put them all in one place for a long time. That's what it's like. Like there's nothing there's nothing redeemable about what's going on like there's no. no drugs there's no like that like ooh cd like like dangerous no it's like we're eating peanut butter and cereal sandwiches we're driving and getting lost or we're like sitting at the venue 4 hours early and doing nothing <laughs> and like it is really not as glamorous as people think it is and, not at all. yeah and that's that's kind of like i'm i'm infatuated with like the with how benign some things and that that's why i've been getting into like I like a lot of comedy podcasts because people talking about like, yeah, like just the process or like writing or, or musically too. But like, <laughs> like I think a lot of people glamorize. I mean, cause that, that's your experience. Like I listen to this album and like, I watched them play and it's beautiful and they're great up there. And it's like, well, yeah. What about those 23 other hours of the day? Like there is, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're calling someone from six hours away trying to like maintain a relationship. They're, you know, <laughs> trying to like each other in that van, like put up with one another. And also like, try to add up all the random dollar bills they can find like oh yeah and then i gotta go home and pay bills with this shit like it's it's so much more than than what you're seeing in that like hours worth of you know a set that yeah. you watch a band and and i think i think if more people got that or understood it then it would be more kind of it'd be more grounds for people to be like oh yeah i should probably buy <laughs> some of their music <laughs> i should yeah. probably buy their shirt like even if Oh, I don't know. That shirt's kind of a weird color and doesn't like feel. You know what? It's it's also more than that. Like you know, just support that. Give the shirt to somebody else. Like it's also, or just put that money in the tip jar. Like it's it's more than what you're than you know what you're seeing. And yeah, it's it's, it's I I think if I were to explain like one of the <clears throat> one of the podcasts I did, I interviewed a buddy who also has a kid, and we were talking about like, well, what happens if your kid wants to be in a band and wants to tour? Like, what do you say to them? And I'm like. What, what do you think of school? How's school doing? You want to go into school? <laughs> like, how about anything? You want to be a, like an electrician or a janitor? Like, yeah, anything else. Anything else is great. Like, go over there. <laughs> yeah, I let him do it. Why not? Yeah, and and I think what it comes and what we talked about too. What it comes down to is like, you know what? If that's what they want to do, I'd have you know, you got to experience that stuff for yourself and find out firsthand. But I mean, any any parent wants the best for their kids. So like, obviously, you don't want them to come into harm's way, but like. Yeah, so yeah, you don't want them to live a life just not being happy either. So unless you, you know. name your child like Crystal or something, some stripper <laughs> name, then you're just asking for it. Sunshine. <laughs> Crystal Sunshine Von Brack is actually my daughter's name now that you Oh, I'm that. sorry, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> so what yeah, man. That's I mean when when I when I I guess when I when I when I envision talking to you, I just kind of more the songwriting or more the musical or instrumentation side, I feel like I want to touch on. And I don't, I don't want to, I guess I just don't know what to ask, but like what, I guess what side of that kind of interests you or like keep like, like, cause I, I feel like you, you could turn around and just take that keyboard apart and just put it completely back together. Like no problem. Like that's what I envision. Well, I didn't know how to do that until recently. And it was that just because something broke and you're like, well, fuck it. I got to figure this out. In, when I was in kiss kiss, Everything was broken. <laughs> Everything was broken. I didn't have like I, we were touring so much. I didn't really have steady jobs, right? And we weren't making a lot of money from the tours. So I had an amp that I found in the garbage that I bought new speakers for, but it barely worked. I had a guitar that I found in the garbage that had been broken so many times that our violinist ex boyfriend put together a pick guard made out of steel for me <laughs> because it was just <laughs> so fucked up. Yeah. So. 
when I stopped touring and I realized I had money, I was like, I should learn how to fix things. Yeah. And right. I actually took a, a tech class for like a year oh, learning nice. how to fix old keyboards and instruments. Yeah. So now if anything behind you breaks, like that's now everything job, you know. works. That's the irony. <laughs> when I was when I was playing music live <clears throat> with people, I had a solid state shitty amp from the eighties. Yeah. Now I have a really nice Fender Twin from the sixties, but I, only I hear it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, so basically, the whole summer summarization of this entire podcast is when you when you have it, you don't need it, and when you need it, you don't have it. When it comes to music, like when you need people to support you, they need you to be doing stuff that you're not capable of doing, and then once you finally can do it yourself, you don't need them, and that's when they come crawling. Well, at least that's how it worked out for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that works out the way for a lot of people, and especially yeah. a lot of people that I talk to. Like, I'm, I, I like talking. Like, I'm, you know, hopefully I'll, I'll get to talk to people who've had you know very big successful successful careers, and that'll be great too. And I've gotten to talk to a couple, but like my bread and butter is like this kind of area where like did some cool stuff, got to do some cool tours, made some friends, but like the, I'm I'm much more interested in the struggle and like you know you know having to like earn your stripes and fix broken shit and play with broken shit and like play out to no one we got banned from knitting factory la for breaking stuff on stage and their wall because <laughs> you know we did a tour where it was just brutal yeah it was our first national tour we were doing each show was individually booked it's not like they strung together in one nice package it was uh, just everything was a one-off every night in a row yeah and after a month and a half of just draining bad shows we get to la and it's packed and it's a great show and we're excited and we get on stage and the first song my keyboard brings. <laughs> and it was just that moment. Yeah. I smashed that keyboard to pieces with uh, the bottom of a mic stand and then threw it through the wall and we were <laughs> never allowed back. Well, what did the what did the crowd think? Do they go wild? I hope so. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> I hope Obviously they... it wasn't good enough to remember. It was authentic. That's There's you know what? About that. There is nothing. There is nothing that's not authentic about your music writing and Kiss Kiss as a band. If that's if that's something that can be uh, that can be translated with this yeah. interview, and I think that's that's a big part of why our bands got along because there there was no feeling of like oh these are some fake dudes or like you know there's like I don't know who these people really are. Like we very quickly got a grasp of who you guys were as people and got along and. And when it came to to rediscover, they were nice people, but I did not get the same feeling of like, oh, I know who these guys are as people. Aside from Wes, the singer who like let us stay at his house and was very nice and like yeah. very cordial to us. But the other guys like like you can just kind of tell like, oh, you guys are in this for like, yeah, you you want to be rock stars like you're not you're not doing this for any other real reason. Yeah, there's a, there's a lack of authenticity right now in music. Yeah. Everything seems, you know, everything is prepackaged and, you know, there's right. just so yeah. much emphasis on fixing things with auto tune and quantizing the beats and playing to the click. Yep. And I kind of miss, like I show my students now the video of smashing pumpkins playing at the VMAs in the nineties. And he breaks, he breaks two strings. This is during disarm. He breaks two strings. You can tell that he's lost his voice. He's holding his throat. He's screaming off key. Yeah. The performance is just angry and just out of tune. Right. Yeah. And at the end of that, my students always go, that was terrible. I said, yeah, but you know why it was terrible? Because they played it live. <laughs> when you watch the MTV Music Awards now, it's coming out of a sound system. Right. It's through live auto-tune, if that, yeah. if it's not a backing track. Yeah. Like, that's authenticity. Yeah. And I always was drawn to bands that would be great one night and might suck the other night because they're humans. And there's not a plan. You know, they just go yeah. on stage and they play music. Yeah, I think it's it's a very big shock and surprise to people when they hear a band they like and they don't sound perfect. And they're like, well, what is this? And you're like, yeah, those are the humans that do that thing. <laughs> like, those are the yeah. real things that play those instruments. Like, it's not going to sound good all the time. Like, I remember that. Unless I was you're actually, Radiohead. Well, unless you're Radiohead. <laughs> there, there were, I was actually thinking this exact thought earlier. I was like, I remember days when we'd play a show and I was like, I... I've never played the drums better. And then the next day I like could not make sense of how to play drums. Like nothing like was clicking or like I was getting out of time or like dropping sticks. And I was just like, what the fuck? Like oh. every day was a battle. And I was like, yeah, I guess that's like, you watch bands that are really good. You watch radio and you're like, they don't have a bad show. That doesn't happen to them. But like, 
it probably does happen to them. Not at this level now, but they did that at some point. Yeah. And I just, I, I would always get so like angry at myself. Like I'm not good enough. Like I'm not, I don't practice hard enough. And like, I'm just constantly fucking or like, yeah, nothing. It's never like all completely working. And I think that's kind of, to me, that's the allure. Like you're watching, like you know, these are human beings. Like that guy got too drunk over there. And this one, like obviously has been singing 10 nights in a row. His fucking voice hurts or like he can't sing tonight or yeah. like that's, that's the, pro- that's, that's another part of the process that people don't really keep in mind with bands. Like these are human beings and like shit's going to break. I mean, shit's not going to work. And to, to, to expect per- perfection all the time it's just like how do you how do you ex- you go and see a, a show for 15 dollars and then you're surprised that like why the fuck aren't these guys absolutely perfect like you know they just they just drove all night from a show the night before when they had four shows the night before that and don't be surprised that fucking something doesn't work or isn't perfect sounding like that's kind of what you're here for if you wanted to watch it be perfect you could have stayed at home put on youtube and watched a music just like the music video or like just listen to the song like that's kind of part of the experience. Do you go to shows now and see everyone on their telephone? Yeah. <laughs> and and what's terrible is like it it. I, I actually talked to Mike about this, like being, and I really don't ha- have that many excuses aside from I can say the you know the kid and stuff like that. But like it takes so much more for me to get to a show. I'm in the suburbs, this and that. I have excuses, but like I've bought tickets for a show and just haven't even gone because it's like. Ugh, this and this and it's a drive and there's this and it's like it's i mean honestly i haven't gone to as many shows yeah. either i mean once you play like 200 shows a year for 10 <laughs> years you're you know what i mean like it, it yeah. the excitement is not yeah and it's that too like i, I did I, see you, hum though okay i had to go see hum and it was great because everyone there was my age and no one was on their phones yeah i was like oh i feel old but this is this is fantastic <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of what it takes now is like because if I were most of the shows I'd probably go to are like if I were just to start going to all kinds of shows, that's mostly the crowd I'd be seeing. And it would just be like disenchant me to want to go to the shows anymore. But like now it's once in a while and it's a band I really want to see. And it's like, OK, yeah, this is this is it. It, it like builds the suspense. It's like when you were younger and you had to like save your money and like you you didn't have a car. So you had to wait for someone to like also be going to the show. And it's like it take it's it builds up the suspense and then finally you go and you're like, ah, oh, yeah, that's that's what this is all for. It wasn't just a random bullshit show I showed up at like this is what I really wanted to go and be a part of. Yeah. <clears throat> so what, so now I've had you for about an hour, so I won't keep you much longer. But I, like, I, I was, I was doing nothing tonight, but just noodling on guitar and hanging out oh, with the nice. cat. Awesome. Um, so what like musically are you listening now? That's, that's like, uh, inspiring you or that you just like to put on when you're just hanging out? Like what, what are you into now? I've been really into Van Dyke parks. Okay. Yeah. I'm not familiar with them. He, uh, Worked with Brian Wilson. He's one of the guys who arranged Smile and did some oh, of the lyrics. Wow. Uh, but he had an album in the 60s called Song Cycle. Okay. And it's it's all orchestral. Super weird arrangements. Mm-hmm. But I've, like, it's been on repeat. Okay. I'm trying to think. My Bloody Valentine, their new record that came out two years ago, I've been loving. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, what's your what's your prized possession back there in that giant vinyl collection? Like, do you are you like you're into vinyl? So are you are you a person that's like buying rare like ones press like all these things, or is it just like, or is it just no, like I don't, I, I don't buy it to cherish. I buy it to listen to. Okay, that's kind of my thing. Is like my collection. The reason I even have a collection is because when I went to school, there was a place down the street that would sell records for like a dollar. So just anything I like even kind of liked or had heard of, yeah. I was like, buy it, buy it, buy it. And so even my most favorite records, like ones that like I would cherish are ones that are like $5 or less and do kind of skip and things. And I'll, like, I'll, I will show you one that I got drunk <laughs> and I bought it like three in the morning. Yes. Like $50. <laughs> and I don't know if I regret it. I don't think I regret it. Hold on. <laughs> That wasn't it. That wasn't it? You didn't just put it on? Oh, wow. And that's like still the... Oh, my God. So what am I... Is that the soundtrack or what is that? No, it's their... They made an EP with the Killer Clown song as the main song. Okay, so, so I will tell you this. One of my absolute favorite horror movies is Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Oh, ironically, do you know what fell? 
Tiny Tim. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that couldn't have been any more planned. Yeah. See, I, I'm a huge. I'm not a huge horror fan, but I'm. I love scary movies, and like, I'd say Killer Clowns is my favorite. Like, I I don't know how to describe it. My favorite funny scary movie, like one that like has all the corniness of like an '80s scary movie, but also is very like fucking creepy. And it's and it's. I think it was one of the first ones I actually ever saw, so it's always kind of stuck with me. But um, I never knew that the Dickies did. So they did the theme song to that movie. They did the theme song, yeah. Wow. And I actually just saw them like four months ago. Okay. They have to be like lead singers in his 60s. Jesus. And he was unbelievable. Like yeah, he was yeah. running around wearing an elf outfit, <laughs> uh, holding a dildo and yelling at people. Like he was, <laughs> it was an amazing show. <laughs> and are you sure this wasn't Donald Trump you saw who was just doing this? No, it was not. It's not Donald Trump. <laughs> you were wearing an elf, an elf outfit? You're Trump. I can tell you're a Trump supporter, right? <laughs> <laughs> very big num- very big number one fan <laughs> shit man I, I, I am I I don't even know I feel like we talked about everything and every idea I had to talk to you about this is great oh, yeah. Um, it, yes so you've got so you got your EP coming out and I'll like I said I'll put some music on from that is there anything else that like I don't know you're into or excited about or want to like promote or that's I mean, it I, yeah that's it that's it awesome and are you are you planning on trying to play play out to the CP like do any probably, shows or probably not yeah no. are you yeah. so you said earlier that like you do love playing shows and miss it but are you at a point now where like you enjoy recording more or is it I think my favorite pro- my favorite part of the process has always been in the studio yeah like I when Kiss Kiss was in the studio those were always like the happiest weeks of my life just yeah. surrounded by keyboards and we had string players and it was just the best okay so i do miss life playing with the studio definitely makes up for that because i get to be creative every day i get to make something every day when you're in a band you know you don't make something every day you make something once and then you play it every day (laughs) you know (laughs) which which is rewarding in itself right but I, i really like creating and making things yeah so yeah i do miss playing live but at this at this stage, it's like you know, thinking about putting a band together is just seems daunting. <laughs> <laughs> and do you find yourself when you're writing or composing for like commercials or like anything like that? Or I mean, you're working with a client, someone's like, "Ooh, make it snappy and this and this." Yeah, like, are you? That's, you said it exactly. <laughs> yes. it's, it's not music I would ever listen to that I like. It took it took a long time for me to actually do it. Yeah. You know, people were always telling me for years, oh, you should do it for money. And I had that, that integrity thing that kept me poor for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and now it, it's a little, it's kind of gone. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> you know, I've been out there, I've been teaching, and I'd rather get paid to sit in my studio and not leave the house, you right. know? So. Well, I think at the very least, it shows that, because, and this isn't to say it's like immature or anything, but like you do, you get to a point where, yeah, you got to pay bills and you got to do this shit. And at the very least, like, you're still doing it with music. Like for me, I'm in an office job. I'm doing it with like a corporate, very like not music thing. So the very, at the very least you can go to bed at night and go, you know what? I'm still creating music. Like even if it's but, something that, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to pop on and listen to It's still like music is affording me to play music. But you're keeping it pure in a sense too. And that's the way I always thought of it. Yeah. Like I, I did jobs when I was in kiss kiss, I did jobs that had nothing to do with music. Yeah, And I did that so I'd separate my musical life, which was a love and a passion from bullshit that I had to do to pay for life. Right. Yeah. So I did like gardening work and landscaping. But yeah, I mean, for me, that kept it pure in a sense where I made I only made the music that I wanted to make. Yeah. So, you know, it's a double edged sword. It works both ways. Okay. Well, I I'm very excited to check out the new stuff, man. I've always been a fan of yours and. Always, always looked up to you musically thinking that like, yeah, like, like I said, like, I feel like you could always take apart a keyboard and put it back together. You could completely compose music. Like you were the whole other side of music that I never could grasp. Like, I don't know those two sides. And I was just like, shit, people who know that they're the musicians. I'm just like a guy who put on a song and learned how to play it that way. Like that was always a, a thing I looked up to musically. So you I know, what, know what I saw the other day, I saw a video of this guy in Haiti playing a one string guitar. It was, it was completely broken. Yeah. It had holes in it, 
like it literally had one string and he played one of the best things I've ever heard. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's all relative. And I look, and then when I saw that video, I looked around my studio and I went, I'm an asshole. <laughs> like, look, at, look at what this dude is doing with one fucking string. I was like, yeah. what do I need 20 keyboards for? Yeah. You know? So it's a, it, it, I go, it goes back and forth. Yeah. You know, it, I don't think, I don't think, uh, you need to be proficient technically to make really good music. Yeah. I think it's uh it's an emotional thing. That's true. It is that as well. Well, good, man. Thank you for doing this. I, I oh, was, thank uh, you for having me. I was, I was surprised that I could get you randomly last minute out of nowhere. And I, uh, I appreciate it, man. As uh one by one, I'm going to get all the kiss kiss members at some point or another. So who do you have left? Rebecca? Uh, Rebecca, Rebecca is one of the ones I've had a few people where like we've rescheduled about 30 times or more back and forth. And she's, oh, one you of and Rebecca? Yeah. yeah. Um, right. yeah. And I did, I did Mike. I don't, I don't know that I'd know any of the basis enough aside from Pat to like okay. interview him and I've done Jared. So, okay. um, but yeah, uh, since, since you guys are like the first tour of ours, like you're the ones who will hold very special to my heart. So like, I nice. got to just knock you off all you, all you off one by one. I'll give you the list of all 19 members. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do a podcast where it's all 19 at the same time over Skype, just all talking at the same time. Uh, yeah. How about, a, how about a kiss kiss reunion where all 19, you get together and have like a barbecue. And <laughs> what, what's funny too, is I, I, when I talked to Mike, I actually told him cause there's, there's this weird incestual chain of all these bands and members that I know that have gotten together. And one of them is, that Jared now plays with guys from who used to be in Dimira. Yeah. And we did dates with them when we toured with the Gay Blades and then Mike played with the Gay Blades. But oh, yeah. D- Dimira broke up in the middle of that tour. And it wasn't even a very long tour. It was like 10 days. And they just broke up in the middle of it. And we were like, and I think the Gay Blades were riding with them. And we were just like, what is happening? Like, they just, nope, they just left the tour. They're done. <laughs> and we're like, all right. <laughs> guess that's what's happening now. Huh. Oh, man. That's good, though. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank you. I appreciate okay. it. It was great catching up with you. Uh, and I, I, you, I'm very excited to hear the new music. All right, man. Good luck with everything, man. Fine, yes, you too. Thank you.